All right. I think we are good to go ahead and get started. Um, I want to welcome everyone to this webinar. We're going to talk about the um, last minute law school application checklist. So some of you are about to submit your applications um, within you know, any time now. So we're going to go over things you should be looking at just to make sure they're polished and ready to go. We have one of our fantastic consultants with us today who's going to walk us through this topic, and I'll have him introduce himself in just a second. Um, for those of you that don't know, Juris Education is a law school um, application consulting company, and we work with students who are going through all aspects of the law school application process from um, thinking about what classes to take when you're pre-law and position yourself um, to be a strong candidate for law schools all the way through taking the LSATs, filling out your applications, um, really every step that you need to take until you get that acceptance letter. Um, and we have Jesse here with us today who works with students just like you through the application process. And I'm going to have him introduce himself before we dive in. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jesse. I graduated from uh, the University of Southern California School of Law in 2022, where I got both my JD and my MBA. And I've been with Juris for uh, several months now, and I um, am really excited to give all the insight that I can uh, to, to you guys, as I know how stressful this process can be. And um, But just know that you're, you're on the right path with Juris, and uh, we'll give you a comprehensive look at this process, uh, even the last minute work. <clears throat> Great. Thanks so much for being here. I'm excited to have you teach us all of the important last minute steps. I know it'll help a lot of people just make sure their application is good and ready to go. Absolutely. So um, today we just did our introductions. We'll talk about the different application components that exist. We'll go over some deadlines and then we'll talk about how to build your own law school application checklist, the things that you should be thinking about. Then we'll go over some tips to make sure everything's ready to go. And then we'll open things up for a Q&A. So if you have questions through this, pop those in the Q&A box and we'll get to those at the end. Um, additionally, we are recording this and we'll be sending it out over email in the next couple of days. You will have access to the entire presentation um, through that. And with that, we will dive right in to talk about the different application components. Jesse, you want to take us away here? Yeah, sure. So definitely the first thing you want to keep in mind is uh, the undergraduate transcripts need to be submitted, and that's through LSAC. Uh, I work with a couple clients now who I recommended that they submit their transcripts as early as possible. So because it, it takes some time to uh, for them to process it, and there may be a situation where, for example, you went to the university and then you applied within the university to like the business school and the business program and the transcript might be set different. Um, so you want to give as much time as possible to, for them to look at it. But once it is submitted, um, you'll want to make sure that you have a GPA that is solid, but um, obviously you, there are certain things that you can't change, right? Like there are certain situations where maybe your GPA isn't as high as what it could be. You always want to add an addendum to explain, 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 explain um, what, what, what happened, what went wrong, what went right in the end, how did you remedy it, and uh, provide like a comprehensive look at, and say, hey, I made a mistake here and I didn't do as well as I wanted to this specific semester or this, this year even, but I took the steps to improve and show that if, as long as you can show a trend, even if it's like this minor trend upward, um, that's really all you can do and, and it'll show that you did your due diligence. Um, I think that's sort of the, the gist of what you wanna keep in mind when, when it comes to the transcripts. Great. Yeah, I think you definitely covered it. And, you know, when you're at this point, your grades are going to set in stones, like Jesse said, making sure that you're able to write about why you have the grades that you did and um, talk about that is important and making sure you're submitting them on time. Yeah. Oh, I also want to add one quick thing is, for example, as 
Hallie just mentioned, you 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 know that certain schools they'll also look at your application holistically, obviously, but they'll also look at your major. So, for example, if you have like a three point five, but it's in like engineering, three point five is already pretty good. But if you get a three point five in engineering, that's going to be weighed more in your favor than a three point five in say business or English because that's a way more intensive STEM based field. So keep that in mind in, when you go through and don't be disheartened if you have like even like a three two, but your major is like computer science. It's going to be different based on what your study, your course of study is. Great. All right, admissions test. So LSAT or GRE, a couple of options here, but you do need to submit those scores. Um, so in terms of the LSAT and the GRE, I personally took the LSAT for law school because that wasn't an option. Um, for me, I know that they've opened that up now and it's really an open question as to, and I, someone just asked, it's a, do they view GRE inferiorly to LSAT? They'll always say no. Uh, it's, it remains an open question as to like what is more important. Um, I will say that from certain admissions offices, uh, in certain schools, they may weigh LSAT, uh, differently compared to the GRE, but at the end of the day, the schools that accept both or either are going to weigh them equal. And so it really will depend on how you score on each of those tests and what uh, score you're able to obtain on them. So for example, I took the LSAT for the law school admissions, and then I took the GRE for the MBA admissions. And then the same question was posed to me when it came to comparing GRE versus GMAT. And the overarching answer uh, from that perspective, which is what I can speak to from my experience, is that the GRE and the GMAT for MBA programs were weighed exactly the same. And so I believe from what I've been told and from my experience that if you're applying and you your school accepts the GRE in addition and or the LSAT, uh, there's, there's not gonna be a distinction between the two. Um, so that's sort of just based on what what experience has told us. But again, who knows, like, you know, certain admissions committees may have things that they have their own perspectives and it, it, it is a little bit subjective sometimes. Um, but I, I wouldn't, if, it, if you're really concerned, you can always take both of them. Um, but I don't think that it's going to be like an extreme decision break, make or break, if you took one or the other, as long as you scored within the threshold that they're requiring, um, your application will be weighed holistically. It sounds like it's very much like submitting an SAT and an ACT score for college, kind of mm -hmm. have the option, they're scored differently, the different tests, but we'll still get you to the same place if the school accepts them. Yeah. Right. So I, at this point, also, while you're you know, coming up with your final checklist for submitting your application, you'll take in your LSAT or GRE. Um, it's just making sure those scores are submitted, you've done the best that you can, um, or no, you need to go take it again before you submit your applications. Um, so just a little bit more on the LSAT here. Um, most of you, I'm sure, have taken it already, but um, if you haven't, just you want to give us a quick overview? Yeah, so definitely LSAT is going to be for the majority. And as we mentioned in the last slide, there are certain schools that accept both GRE and LSAT, but some schools only accept LSAT, and um, they, they look, seem to be sticking by that, but who knows? But if you're taking the LSAT um, and you've taken it in September or November and you didn't get the score you want uh, or need that's with, within the threshold of the school that you're you're really shooting for, uh, I always recommend taking it again, uh, even if it means delaying your application, if it's not within the threshold of what you 
what will give you the strongest chance. For example, from my own experience, I took the LSAT when it was only, it wasn't offered multi, that many times a year. It was offered like, I think July, September, and December. And so I took it in September and the deadline for some of the top schools were in December that I wanted to, that were on my list of top schools were in December, but I was like, I didn't get, I was like far below what I needed to, to obtain in order to get to get, have a fighting chance at one of these schools. So I took it again in December and I was like, this is so late. I'm not going to get the scores back in time. It'll take time to process, but I just did it. And I, I scored a lot higher in December. And what I didn't do was I didn't just give up and I didn't just say, oh, well, like I didn't apply early or earlier than I could have. And so now I'm not going to have the chance. No, I went to the networking events. I spoke to admissions counselors. I told USC specifically after meeting the admissions ambassador at the, uh, the law school fair saying, hey, I'm this is like my top choice. I really want to go here. And my LSAT score improved drastically. And that's sort of why I didn't feel comfortable applying early. She understood that. She actually remembered me when I went to the accepted students um, dinner event that they invited us to. They like flew us all, the admitted students, to LA to, to see the school and the campus. And it was just about, again, looking at the whole application as a, as, as a holistic kind of endeavor. And so it wasn't just the fact that I did better on the LSAT, but it was the fact that I went out and I networked and I spoke with people and I expressed my interest and I reiterated it and I showed that commitment to uh, getting what I wanted in the end. Uh, and the LSAT score was definitely a step in the right direction in terms of my score increase. Um, but, you know, all, at the end of the day, the long story short is that you don't have the score that you want. Uh, uh, you're, you still have time. You can take it in January, you'll get the score back, and you can amend your addendums or whatever supplemental uh, essays that you need in order to provide that additional context of why your score changed and you'll have uh you'll, you'll still have a fighting chance so if if you feel like it's too little too late don't have that mindset just keep uh keep pushing and and you know who knows sometimes people will apply early with you know a not so strong application and they get denied because well they rushed and their application wasn't as strong as it could have been and at this juncture you're not gonna get getting your application in just a little bit later if you if you if you need a score that's higher is gonna pay off in the long run so make sure you take uh, a slow and steady approach and, and do your best to to give the fullest and strongest case for why you should be admitted that's a really great um, piece of advice I'm glad you brought that up uh, someone said Lisa that, yeah Lisa Lee said, if you, your LSAT increases drastically, you would need to still add an addendum. Yes, you do. Uh, I did that, and a lot of schools ask that specifically. They're like, okay, well, why'd your LSAT jump? So I can just disclose to you what I scored. So I got a 155 in September of, like, 2017 when I applied. And then <clears throat> I was, like, really upset, and it wasn't the score that I wanted because that you know, was, like, way below the range. Then I ended up getting a six, a 11 point increase to 166 in December. And I had to write that in my application because first of all, it's, it's not like unheard of to like have a score increase, but you, you want to explain to them why that happened. Um, because sometimes they're just curious as to like what changed. And, and it's another opportunity for you to show that you have a demonstrated commitment to getting what you uh, want to achieve. And I, what I said in my addendum was, uh, you know, I was, the reason I didn't do as well the first time was because I, I was working part-time and also taking a course part-time while starting for the LSAT, so it was a lot on my plate. So then I decided after getting my score back to focus more intently on studying, I dedicated more hours, I studied every day, every morning, and I just walked them through, you know, what steps I made to change the result. And it was a very simple, like, 250-word um, addendum, and, and that was what was included. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's definitely helpful for everyone here um, to know, you know, you still have options, even if you didn't get the score you wanted, you can still apply and still make those adjustments. 
Um, and then the slide here, we just talk about the GRE. We I think, covered this a couple of slides ago. Um, so we don't need to dive in too much here. Um, most of you know what it is. And if you took it to apply to schools, um, you're good to go. Yeah. I, I like just to add a little bit on that. I like what you said before about like comparing the SAT and ACT. I think that's exactly how schools who accept both of these tests kind of liken it to. And so if you're taking the LSAT like multiple times and like just not getting the score that you want, uh, I would recommend taking the GRE and seeing if you get significantly higher or higher at all. And so that they have like more evidence of you, first of all, trying and being gritty and being resilient, but also to see if maybe it was just the test and the formatting that kind of threw you off. Because the GRE is also a test of your knowledge and your intelligence. And obviously having, you know, a bunch of low LSAT scores and one really high GRE score is going to be better than just having a bunch of low LSAT scores. Not that like, uh, one test or the other by itself is better per se, but it gives them a more holistic view of who you are as a candidate. So that's how I would per perceive uh, these tests. Great, yeah, thank you, um, perfect. And I guess just to add to that too, uh, make sure you are applying, if you're using the GRE, make sure the school you're applying to accepts the GRE. So there's only seven the schools that accept those. You just want to do your due diligence there. All right. So personal statements. Um, you want to walk us through that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So a personal statement is obviously going to be the crux of your application. It's going to be who you are. Yeah. Obviously, aside from like your GPA and your letters of recommendation, which are all those three are like the, the most important components. But when I look at a personal statement and when I go ahead of, uh, to to write one or to revise one for one of my clients, uh, I always recommend that they hone in on one, one or two. But I like to just focus on one like moment or event or project that you really kind of were engaged in and engrossed in. Because remember, the personal statement should not be your resume. Your resume, you're already going to give it to them. It should not be a laundry list of what you've done. It should be a focus on uh, who you are, of course, but also a focus on, I, I like to recommend a focus on a particular event or, or moment that kind of encapsulates why you want to become an attorney or become a lawyer. It could be a moment from your childhood. It could be a moment from one of your professional experiences. It could be a moment in school. Uh, and it, or it could just be like a period of time or a project. So it could be not necessarily like a, a moment per se, but like a period of time as well. But I like to focus in and, and really go deep on a particular topic that um, encapsulates your like, this slide says your passion, your originality, and uh, what you bring to the table. So for example, for my uh, statement, my personal statement, I focused on the fact that I was really interested in immigration law because I am a child of immigrants. And so I kind of wove into my own story about growing up and being uh, sort of in engrossed and immersed in Western culture while also coming from that background where I was raised by a very uh, East Asian household. And so I wanted to kind of analogize how my background and how I could bring these experiences to the table in, in the law school context, but also uh, contribute meaningfully as an aspiring immigration attorney, um, which I did for a little bit. But that was sort of my um, experience, my singular experience that, that encapsulated why I wanted to pursue a career in law because I wanted to help other uh, immigrants who want to come to America for better opportunities and uh, help them with their visa applications and things of that nature. And uh, I think that was what ultimately um, came through to the admissions committee. It also helped uh, because you want to make sure that your personal statement is relevant to, to some extent, uh, your 
area of study or your or your professional experience. So, for example, immigration made sense to me because I was a business major, but also I was a Chinese language and literature major, and so I have that international kind of international business、uh, perspective that is really relevant to immigration law and specifically business immigration law, which is what I specialized in after law school for a bit, and so there. What I'm trying to get at, at the crux is that your statement should really kind of tie in、uh, all of the facets of your education, but also your personality and what you want to deliver. It's like the past, the present, and the future、uh, in one. And I, I get that that's kind of like a vague concept. So if you have more specific questions for me, you can definitely ask them in the Q and A. But I just wanted to get that across and make sure that you're really honing in on something in particular. Yeah, think. That's definitely fantastic advice, and I like that. Especially at the beginning, you pointed out that you definitely want to. You don't want to reiterate your resume. You want to add something new. You want to use the space that you have to add a new dimension to who you are, and really let the admissions committee get to know you and know why you are passionate about law,、um, rather than just reiterating things that were said in different parts of your application. All right, letters of recommendation are also crucial. Yeah, so、uh, I can speak to my perspective as because I, I I'm a K JD, which means like kindergarten to JD. I I didn't work in between college and, and law school.、So、that's like a term. If any of you guys、uh, are are doing that, you'll you'll hear that a lot in law school, I think. But、um, I so all my letters of recommendation were from teachers and, and professors. They weren't from like my.、Uh, Bosses or supervisors or anything.、Um, so, but that doesn't mean that you can't do that. I, in fact, would recommend you look for a supervisor or a professional recommendation if you're if you've been out of school for for some time.、Uh, obviously, the best case scenario is you are able to connect with the professor and have both like an academic and a professional recommendation. But make sure that these are classes and, and experiences, whether professional or academic, that are really Uh, positive that you think you really thrived in and did did well, and that's not necessarily to say that they have to be classes that you got an A in. So, for example, I got a recommendation from my business law professor in undergrad, and I struggled a lot in that class. I got like a B plus, but I think the professor really acknowledged that I had a unique perspective, and she made me a TA even to help like design and structure the the course and and the way that. Her assignments were were kind of divvied up throughout the semester because she understood that I was pretty organized, but also very creative and and was interested in learning about different ways people studied. So、um, definitely, as long as you think you have a really great relationship with them, the better the relationship, the better. If it's just a class, if it's, I would say. Don't focus solely on what class you did the best in, because you could have gotten like an A plus. But if it wasn't like a seminar with like four hundred other students, they may not be able to give like that tailored、uh, recommendation letter that you will really make you stand out.、Um, but obviously, if you do refresh their memory or refresh their recollection, which is like a legal term, if if you want to do that and and speak to them and be like, you know, this is what I did. And, If you recall X, Y, or Z events that you know made you stand out as a student, even if it was a big class, maybe they do remember you, or they'd be willing to write about things that you can you know show to them that you did in their class that made you stand out and be an excellent student. Then that that should be fine as well. But I would just make sure that whoever you ask your recommendation from, they're willing to put in the time and effort and give you the details that you need to really have it be like a glowing recommendation. Okay, so that's that's sort of the gist of it. Great. All right, so your resume is also going to be something that you will add.、Um, can I walk us through that? Yeah, absolutely. So the resume is super, super important.、Um, not just in terms of like, of course, everything on this slide is goes without. Saying like you need to have all of these things included. These are the elements to it.、Um, if you have honors, definitely include that. If you have a GPA that's high, you can always underline or bold it and make it stand out a little bit more.、Um, but 
the thing about resumes is that you want to make sure it looks aesthetically just from, pers- from like a glance, it looks like uh, a really professional document um, because it's the first thing that people look at is, is it, did this person, like, I don't even care. And I don't, I think an admissions committee member and I have a classmate who was an admissions um, ambassador for, for USC law school where they were just like saying like, this person had like a really good resume in terms of like substance and what they did, but they just put it together so sloppily. Like there were typos or like the spacing was off. Like that stuff is actually important quite important because it's not just about, oh, you got a 4.0. It's about demonstrating that you got a 4.0 because you're a great student and because you're organized and because you can put together a very simple document in a way that is, because it's really hard to do. I mean, if you're not really focused and tuned into this process, it's easy to just like make a simple mistake like that and, and get your application kind of not tossed out, but like looked at a little bit differently than what you would want. So I definitely say take a meticulous approach. Make sure that when you have a resume to minimize as much white space as possible. Make sure the text extends across the entire page. Make sure the margins are right. Make sure your name is in bold at the top. Like just dot your I's and cross your T's and make sure that it looks formatting wise really good. But also, and this is goes down to, and this goes back to any resume kind of workshop or advice you might have gotten in undergrad is that you want to make sure that you're showing in your bullet points within each, each experience what you did to contribute. It's like the so what factor is what I like to call it. Make sure that you, with every job responsibility, you say, I did X, Y, or Z, which resulted in a this numerical percent increase in something. If you can add that, that's always good to add numbers. Say you led a team of 10 people. I'm just giving an example. I increased customer satisfaction by X percent, you know? make sure that you're showing that you contributed to something and your position added value to whatever experience you were in, because you don't want to just be a taskmaster and do, Oh, I put books away. No, you streamlined the uh, book collection process at your local library, thereby increasing, you know, make sure that you, and obviously don't lie, make sure it's accurate. Ask your supervisor, ask someone if there are metrics that you can, kind of attribute your uh, duties to and, and what you contributed to, because at the end of the day, like your role mattered, no matter how small it was. And you need to make sure that that point comes across in your resume. So uh, long story short, focus on the structure and how it looks aesthetically, that it, everything's aligned and make sure that when you write down your experiences, make sure substance, substantively uh, you're explaining why it was important or the so what factor. I feel like attention to detail and formatting is pretty important for lawyers, um, especially as you graduate and start law careers. So this is a great way to start to hone that ability and show that you have an attention to detail. You're paying attention to the formatting and making sure things are popping out. Um, And there's also a lot of different resources online that can help you with a resume, will help you find areas to put more metrics in and we'll kind of grade them for you. But we also have a lot of consultants like Jesse who can help with this as well and really help you um, format and get the most out of your resume. All right. So let's briefly talk about deadlines. I don't think we need to go massively in detail here um, before we move on to things you should be paying attention to. Yeah, so I remember these are just the general uh, deadlines. I will say that there are certain schools that have a rolling admissions deadline timeline. And what that basically means is that like the earlier get, you can submit it whenever up until like the final final deadline of when they'll accept applications but if it's rolling that means they're they're reviewing it as they go and so you just want to get it in as soon as possible um and the earlier the better for rolling um again like i said before in terms of early decisions like yeah a lot of the early decisions in thailand have passed already and but don't be disheartened because uh 
you know, there's only a certain percentage of people are going to get in early. Some of them might be deferred to the regular pool, and that's where, where you'll end up in if you apply before the regular admissions deadline and if you miss the early one. That gives you more time to fortify your application. That gives you more time to focus on improving your LSAT. And you're going to get your LSAT score for January before a lot of these deadlines for the regular admission. So make sure that you are keeping your eye on the prize and not focusing on, oh, I missed the early decision. Um, Because that's not necessarily going to be what makes or breaks your application. You could have submitted it early and still not gotten in because of some other factor that maybe mislooked. Or or, um, it it could just be something that you didn't consider. But at the end of the day, you can't focus on whether you missed an early decision deadline. You can only focus on what's in front of you and, and getting to, you know, getting in as soon as possible before the regular, while having a quality application, of course. Yeah. That's some great advice, definitely. All right. So building your law school application checklist. So your you know, final review checklist, you have finished all of the pieces, what are things that you should review before submitting it? Yeah, I think this goes, well, that's saying, but we can just walk through it. Make sure that you submit all, if this really goes without saying, but make sure you, you have all the components. If there's a supplemental essay, make sure you've submitted a supplemental essay. Sometimes you can even submit the application if you don't have that attached. So you can't really miss it. Sometimes there's optional essays, and whenever you see the word optional, so long as it's not something like completely unrelated or something you really can't speak to, like if you don't have a disability or something and they want information on that or something like that, which is different. But if it's an optional essay about like how you can contribute to the diversity of the school or to why why the school is special sometimes that's even an optional essay always 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 write something for that and make sure it's of quality of course because they want someone who is it you never want an application that's just like at par or just exactly what they need you want to make yourself stand out because this is a very competitive process so whenever something's optional and you can add something to it you should write you should write that optional essay um, spreadsheets are also great. Um, if you don't like spreadsheets, make a table on Microsoft Word, whatever you need to do, and, and write down the deadlines. I like to you know, write it down on a post-it note or something or on a whiteboard that I have in my room just to like, have a visual reminder of what I need to finish. Um, and categorizing components, of course, like we discussed before, there's definitely a lot of things that you need to consider if you need to focus on your outset score. Focus on your tutoring sessions. Focus on what sections you're not doing well in. Have a whole component of your uh, calendar that's dedicated to that. If your resume is something that you really are concerned about because you don't have that many extracurriculars, focus on that. And we can help you with that, of course. The jurors, tutors are always here to help you and have gone through this process uh, before so we can really speak to what works and what doesn't. And of course, prioritize tasks. So definitely implement SMART goals, which is like prioritizing what, uh, but also making sure that they are, you know, manageable in a in a period in a specific uh, period of time. Uh, Making sure that you are categorizing things by what is a priority, what is mid priority, and what can you kind of like let slide for this week because it's not an immediate red flag or concern that you need to address right now. But having kind of these uh, buckets of items that you need to get done will definitely help you make sure that you your 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 timeline and, and your checklist is is up and running because you don't want to you don't want to miss certain things because you worked on something that wasn't a priority and then you missed a deadline because you wasted your time on something that could have wait that could have waited. Um, Definitely number six, I love this break down your task because I remember when I was taking the bar, for example, which is like a super daunting task. Uh, and I can analogize this to the law school admissions process because this is like the hardest thing to do before law school is getting into law school. And then the hardest thing after law school is taking the bar. So these are two of like the biggest kind of milestones and they're really big milestones too. And so breaking down your tasks, like 
today you're going to work on this section. Today you're going to work on your, per you can't do everything all at once. So breaking it down, if, especially if you're overwhelmed, that's the most important thing you can do. Even at a time like this where you think everything needs to be done now because you're late to the game and there's so little time left, you have enough time. Like, and you have to keep thinking that way. Not in the, in the sense that you have a lot of time and you have unlimited time, but you have enough time to get what you need to get done, done in a way that is a quality. So, but you can't get it all done all at once immediately. That's never going to work. Just make sure that you break down your schedule day by day, if hour by hour, even if, it, if that helps you. But um, if anything seems overwhelming, always look at it in smaller chunks. That's what I, what I really recommend. Um, and include optional materials is what I said before. Double check, triple check everything. Like, that's sort of the biggest thing as an attorney that I've learned. Um, I was recently barred this year in May, but um, even before that, throughout law school, one of the biggest things that you'll get, especially in legal writing classes, which you have to take your first year, is like, it's all about attention to detail. It's all about like, did you put the right name of the client, of the plaintiff or of the defendant? Like, did you put the right caption? Like, these are really simple things and sometimes the paralegal will do it, but you can't always rely on them. You have to make sure that you you go through and see that everything is checked off and done correctly because like that, that, that's basically what being a lawyer is about, is about making sure that everything, um, all the details are squared away before you submit anything. Uh, and, and that's the final review too. Make sure that you're at the end of the day, the master of this application. People can help you throughout the process, putting it together, substantively reviewing it, revising. But at the end of the day, this is the product that your name is going to be on. And so you want to make sure that this application is something that you're proud of. Uh, someone said optional materials. This includes criminal history. What if I have no registration ticket from like 10 years ago? Um, I don't know what that means. You want to... Yeah, whoever asked that, if you want to clarify, um, pop that clarification in, and we can definitely touch on that yeah. um, once we get to the Q&A in a couple of slides. Yeah. All right. So tips for ensuring everything is ready for submission. So you have your very extensive list of all the things you need, all of the deadlines that you can check off and make sure you have everything. Um, what else should you be taking a look at, especially as you're about to submit? Um, sometimes, <laughs> and I I don't know if LSAC is because I can't look at the current LSAC portal now because it's by candidate and it's different from, I'm assuming it's different from, from a few years ago when I applied, but I will say that if you can check it, if it's an option that is, uh, that, I know has happened in the past, which is that some people submit their supplemental essay for the wrong school. Uh, and, and that looks really bad because you're basically just saying you didn't pay enough attention to the fact that you're submitting a wrong essay to, a, to the wrong school. So make sure that if you go through it and you can look at the preview of the file, make sure that the right school's name is in the essay, if it's mentioned at all in the essay, in your, especially in the, like the Y UC Irvine essay or the Y Emory Law essay, you know what I mean? Like make sure that you have the correct essay matching to the correct application. I don't know if it's different now that it allows you to uh, submit separate, I, I'm assuming you have to submit separate supplemental essays, especially if it's one that's tailored to a certain school, but always proofread and, and preview the file before submitting everything because I'm, I don't believe that there's any technology now that will automatically flag that for you. You're going to have to do that yourself. Um, but that's something that I can speak to, not from my own personal experience, but from what I've heard from classmates who have applied. Um, that's a really bad, <laughs> bad thing and a really easy fix too. Yes, definitely. All right, and so then you also just want to go through your document checklist, make sure you have everything that you need, make sure the correct documents are attached. Um, that just goes through the double and triple checking. Just you think you did it right the first time, just double check. 
Um, you don't want to not be submitted based on a silly error, like putting in the wrong school name in a supplemental essay or attaching the wrong file. Um, and then also, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say like the application guidelines, like I think the one thing that stands out for this specific factor is word limit. Uh, I, I don't, I feel like from what I remember, they won't even let you submit essays that are more than the word limit, but if they do, just double, triple check if you can, like that you're within the 500 or 750 word limit, if there is one, because you don't want to submit something that's way longer and then they'll be like, you didn't pay attention to the rules. And that's going to mark you down even more. Because there is like a rubric that they look at in, in terms of like checking things off and evaluating you and, and, and your candidacy, uh, at least from what I've experienced in, at USC. That there's certain things that they'll look to and, and you don't want to show that you are careless. Yeah. Definitely. Right. And then apologies, this title is wrong here. Should have triple checked that. Um, but you also want to make sure you're meeting deadlines. You want your resume to be very professional and you want your standardized test scores to be submitted um, on time. Anything to add to any of those points? Uh, no, I think that's those are the key components, definitely. And um, as just a reminder, if you submit multiple LSAT scores and your score jumps significantly, explain that. And or if your scores are low and unfortunately consistently low, and, and if you are really run out of time, you can't take another uh, round of LSATs before the deadline, for example, then also add an addendum explaining that. Uh, but if there's something worth explaining that you need to explain or, or should, definitely include that. Um, even if it's a jump, you know, score in the, in the awkward yeah. direction. Um, and then, yeah, optional essays, an addendum, and then make sure you're just giving everything a once over again before you submit your application. Yeah, yeah. And you can use the list you created um, earlier to make sure you're going through every piece that you need to be going through. So that wraps up all of the content that we have for you all. Um, and now we can answer some questions. I know we've answered a couple already, but we'll answer some more. So keep popping questions in. Um, and then just as a heads up, we sometimes get questions that are very specific to people's circumstances. And while we would love to be able to answer those for you, sometimes we just don't have enough information on your particular circumstance to give um, good advice. And so in that case, definitely recommend that you reach out to our team on our website and we can schedule time with you to go over those questions in more detail and learn a little bit more about your situation. So we're giving you the best advice possible. Um, yeah. And then, yeah. So I think that would be, Lisa, that's a question that I think would be better suited for a consultation with someone specific. Yeah. Uh, I see there's another question. Is it too late if you are looking for scholarships and going for fall 2024? No, it's never too late for scholarships. I know people who, there are scholarships that you can obtain even after you start law school. I know for a fact that there are diversity scholarships that uh, some of my classmates have gotten in their 2L years for uh, essay writing contests or things like that. There's always scholarship opportunities out there. If you're talking about merit scholarships though, that, uh, is going to be given to you by the school after you are admitted. So there's no really, unless there's like an additional essay that they require for those merit scholarships that you didn't write or something for some reason and you submit it, then maybe it's too late. But in general, the merit scholarships will be given to you after you are admitted. Uh, and not after you accept the admission, they'll give it you, they'll give you obviously like a, an amount usually. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, someone, yeah. That's what, that's what I have to say about that. Great. How about foreign degrees? How do you evaluate them? Yeah. Uh, a couple questions about international students and the application components there. Um, 
as well. So this you might have to contact us about so we can make sure we have all of the information for you and your particular degree. Um, yeah, I'm sure you have more to say on this, but I think you're going to have to submit all of the standard application materials. There might be extra things you need to submit that you would need to defer to each school for. Yeah, and I think some of our, I mean, our team definitely can speak more to specific experiences and requirements that they may have. Um, but I can, yeah, I can only echo what she just, Ali just said. Yeah. Um, and then I just want to make sure that we, you know, that we touched on a couple of questions earlier, but I do want to circle back just in case people missed those answers. Um, so if you can just briefly answer again, do schools view the GRE inferiorly to the LSAT or they are, are they about the same? Oh, yes, uh, they are the same. If the school accepts both of them, I mean, or either or. Uh, then they're going to be evaluated the same. That's what they state. Uh, again, you never know what's inside the admissions committee's minds when they evaluate. So it, there's no point in guessing. You can only trust what is written. And what is written is that they evaluate it similarly uh, or to the exact same degree, really. And I've asked this question before even to, because GREs now is being accepted for even other specialty programs like MBA programs, for example, the GRE versus the, the, the GMAT. And I've always asked that question to the admissions committee too, and they say the same thing. Uh, someone said, is it too late to schedule a consultation if you want to submit in general? No, I don't think it's too late. No, definitely not. Um, I think the more time we have, the better, so we can help you through as much as we possibly can, but it's definitely not too late. I think at this point, we can probably give your application a really good look, give you a lot of suggestions to help um, make it stronger. Um, and still give you enough time to make those edits to submit. Um, Someone said they wanted to schedule, but it was rejected. So you can schedule by going to our website, so juriseducation.com, and you can fill out, there's a schedule a consultation button um, and a, a form on the majority of our pages that you can schedule a time to talk to us. Um, if yours was rejected, send, if you want to pop your email, your name and email address into the um, chat box, I can go ahead and send it over to our team just to make sure that we um, can get you, get you in there. Um, yeah, Darian, yeah. just send the uh, email and we'll get back to you specifically. Here's yeah, the definitely. And then for those of you that want to schedule a consultation, you can do that on our site. Um, I know things this week are pretty booked, but we do have a lot of openings for next week um, and beyond that. Someone said summer internships, private practice versus government versus nonprofits. Doesn't matter across, I can say categorically that does not matter so long as it makes sense towards the overarching theme of your application. If you are really you know, interested in it, pursuing a nonprofit career, having that nonprofit experience will definitely help and bolster that case for you and make it make sense to the admissions. Like really just imagine like logically speaking how this person's going to evaluate your application. If you're all your, if you were only in finance and only working for like hedge funds and all of a sudden you want to make a U-turn and do something completely unrelated, it's not necessarily going to be a kill for your application per se, but it will definitely be a harder case to make. So what I would recommend is don't focus on what you've done for, per se. It's just going to be a matter of how you relay that information to create a cohesive application. Uh, and, and it really does not matter. No, I mean, if your question is, do they weigh one thing more favorably than the other? No, they, at law schools are increasingly trying to get a greater breadth of people with different experiences. So whether it's in finance, whether it's nonprofit, whether it's in medicine, whether it's in engineering, they're going to want that because that just gives more diversity to the classroom and that gives more uh, opportunities for people like you who have a specialty kind of background to then 
be able to apply that to a more specialty legal area. So for example, I had a classmate, his name is James, a really good friend of mine. He worked for Google for a period of time before going to law school. And then after he you know, finished his degree, he got his job at Cooley, which is a law firm that specializes in uh, a lot of tech startups like legal innovation. They have a really big tech uh, centered kind of practice area. And so I'm sure, and he's explained to me specifically that that experience at Google and tech was a key factor in his interview process to getting a job there. So it really depends on what you want to do with your degree and what you want to explore uh, and, and tying that into how that experience will relate to your future practice as a lawyer. Yeah. And looks like we have another question on, do you have thoughts on going to a top 20 versus a top 50? So I like this question. Um, how do I answer this? So it depends on, so, so someone said, and I, this is from like a famous book. It's called Getting to Maybe, I believe. Don't quote me on that. I'm pretty sure it's from Getting to Maybe, but it said either go, it, and I don't, necessarily agree with it complete, completely, but I agree to a certain extent. And it, it's the quote said, go to T14 or go for free. In other words, if you're gonna pay sticker price, make sure that you're going to like a really elite top ranking school or alternatively go to law school for free, with that gives you a free tuition because you got a huge scholarship or something, even if it's lower ranked. So I think the difference between a top 20 school, what top 20 are we talking? Are we talking about like top seven or top like 14 to 20? And then when I'm saying top 50, it really is going to be like a balancing act. Do you get what I'm saying? It's going to be about how much more high ranked is that school and also look to their bar percent, their bar passage rate, their employment rate. All these things are public uh, reported to the American Bar Association that are made public. If you literally Google search X, Y, or Z school, USC Gould School of Law employment rates, and in what sectors, they'll break it down for you, make sure that these are reputable schools. And then look to how much money are each of these schools giving you. You don't want to be going to like a marginally better school, but paying sticker price versus if you could go to like a less ranked school and go for free. And and really the difference between like, you know, top 20, like some, a school ranked 20 that you're going to for full tuition versus 25 where you're going for um for free you know that's going to be a bad that i think that the better decision in that case would be to go to the top 25 school versus the top 20. so it really will depend on the two schools the reputations and well as how much money they're giving you um if that is a huge factor for you and not for a lot of people like myself it, it definitely was so um that's something you'll definitely if you have specific questions uh do a consultation with us and we can explore that in more detail um, but it really will depend on the circumstances for sure. Yeah. I'm sure also what you're looking to study. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I think another question that I don't know if we touched on was um, someone mentioned their focus for their personal essay was or the focus for the personal experience essay that led them was what led them to criminal defense um is it okay to submit that even if the school's focus isn't necessarily criminal law what do you mean by their focus is not on criminal law? like their program is not like super reputable in that area yeah i think it's if the school's main like main programs aren't criminal law but they're interested in that and wrote their essay about that is it still okay to submit that um I think it is okay. I think the question will become, oh, why aren't you applying for X, Y, or Z programs that are more specialized in that? And I think it's going to come down to, um, first of all, this is a personal statement. I think across the board that sh this shouldn't matter because you're applying this personal statement for a bunch, a large net of schools that you're, it's not going to be this differentiated by school. If this is for an optional essay, the way you can caveat this is say, this school is very unique to me, even 
and don't ever say anything bad about the criminal law program or, or any any sub program about the school, obviously, but just say what is unique about the school to me is that, you know, I plan to practice law in this region or if the school is in Southern California, for example, say like, you know, you have connections in this area and you grew up here and you want to be able to practice in this area. And so the school really resonates with you because this program has, and then also go into detail about what is unique about this, this school's program. It doesn't really matter if it's necessarily like high ranked or reputable, if there's, if it has a unique factor that you think is interesting and something you want to gain from that education, highlight that and show them that that's something that you want to do. And honestly, from the admissions perspective, they're always looking for students who are going to contribute and build the school's reputation, right? So if you're really, you know, gung ho about criminal defense and you have that experience and background and you have a clear demonstrated uh, pathway to this type of career, that kind of is a positive indicator for them because they're going to want to, if they have like a, a lesser known criminal law program, they're going to want people like you to help build that out more and increase that reputation or aspect of the school. So don't think about in the way of like, oh, well, this school is not really good in this area. Just focus on make, making sure that you tailor your essay to fit and to explain why it's unique to you, the school's unique to you, and what factors about it appeal to you. Make sure that it's personal. Like you, you couldn't have written this essay to just any school. If you wrote this essay for this specific school. Awesome. Thanks. I think that was a great answer. Um, that brings us to our time today. I want to thank everyone for joining us. It was great to have you all. You had some fantastic questions. And Jesse, thanks so much for walking us through all of this. It was great to have you. Um, and um, yeah, it was Glad to have you and glad that you could share all of this information with us. Um, a reminder, we are sending this presentation out via email. So you will get a recording of it to watch as many times as you want. Go back to what you need. Um, you can also schedule a consultation on our website and talk to our team about how we can potentially help you wrap up your applications. Um, definitely reach out if you have any questions and we'll be happy to answer those. I hope everyone has a great rest of their night. Um, thanks again, Jesse. Thank you, of course.